The Industrial Revolution changed the face of Britain. Canals and then railways were developed to transport raw materials and finished goods in bulk. Towns and villages were no longer self-sufficient and relied on the delivery of supplies. While the railways eventually superseded the canals as bulk carriers, goods still needed to be delivered by road to rail depots and collected from stations for local deliveries. The horse and cart would soon be challenged by the lorry. Well, really, the commercial vehicle is as old as the motor car itself. In fact, in the 1890s, up in Liverpool, they held trials for so-called heavy commercial vehicles, and famous firms like Leyland and Thornycroft took part in those trials. So it was very much appreciated that whereas the motor car was eventually going to replace the, the horse and carriage, the commercial use of uh, vehicles like that was so important because stopping and starting a horses all the time and delivering things is much more difficult than stopping and starting a motor vehicle. So they really developed in parallel. In 1897, the Royal Agricultural Society of England offered a prize of £100 for the best motor van carrying a load of one tonne or over. The Leyland Company of J. Sumner, now named the Lancashire Steam Motor Company, which was manufacturing steam lawnmowers, entered a vehicle, the only one to complete the course. Sumner developed further oil and coke-fired vehicles. They had coached wooden road wheels and steel tires. And from now on, the firm devoted most of its energies to road locomotion. Generally, the beginnings of road transport were slow and uncertain. Initially, larger loads were hauled by steam power by large and heavy four-wheeled tractors which towed one or more load-carrying trailers. They were a direct substitute for teams of horses and hauled the same large wheel trailers which horses had pulled. There were also steam lorries in which both the means of propulsion and the load-carrying space were combined in one vehicle and these soon outnumbered the steam traction engines. But steam was to prove just a fascinating byway and never flourished as it did on the rail. They were difficult to drive, needed to carry their own fuel supplies, usually coal, and needed to stop at frequent intervals to fill up with water. Cities with a large number of steam vehicles, such as Liverpool, with its docks traffic, even had water hydrants on busy roads, especially for use by the steamers. people say let's go back to the horse but it wasn't very environmentally friendly if you look at London in the horse drawn days you had to have crossing keepers and they weren't people who stopped the traffic to let you cross so much as people who swept the dung and mess away so that ladies and gentlemen in nice shoes could walk across the road without getting too dirty and in fact in London round about the turn of the century too even horse slaughter of sort of animals that were dying or had died was quite a problem because they, they take up a lot of room and you have to dispose of them somehow or other and also the, the, the nice view of your local greengrocer with his horse drawn carts is fine but if you went round the back and looked at his yard you'd probably find a horse, a stable the vegetables in one corner and a steaming pile of horse manure not very far away which isn't really very hard unit Mechanically propelled road vehicles were not very popular in this country. Magistrates, the establishment, the church, most people were against them, which is why the French and the Germans were ahead of us in making motor cars. We didn't really have any factories to produce vehicles until the turn of the century. So most of the early vehicles were imported, and they tended to be imported and bought by sort of rich sons of squires and people like that who didn't agree with the old-fashioned attitude. From that, slowly, it developed that they could carry goods as well, perhaps initially small samples and small things, and then gradually it got bigger. By about 1905 or thereabouts, a, a need for lorries or commercial vehicles of a sort was perceived, just as it was for buses too. And then it jogged along in a way with some people making sort of lorry versions of cars and other people providing something a bit bigger and more specialised. And then you also had the steam lorry makers who were perhaps a slightly different class.
and initially fairly popular and successful, but, but Steam ultimately proved a dead end, as it did with railways, I suppose. Commercial vehicles have been around since sort of 1900-ish, uh, and the very early ones aren't so very different to this. In the start of the century, no one was quite clear whether petrol vehicles were going to predominate, or whether steam or even electricity might hold the key. And of course, there were still lots of horse-drawn commercial vehicles around. But gradually, by about 1910, it was vehicles somewhat similar to this that were beginning to show that they, they were the future. That's not to say that, that steam was beaten. Uh, certainly, electricity was beaten, except for very light delivery vehicles. Steam had its adherence and kept going up to about 1930, but in really relatively small numbers. And it was the, the three-ton truck that more or less became the standard heavy vehicle of the industry. And it's extraordinary to think that this is as heavy as you could get in those days. This is actually a four-ton and made just after the First World War. And it was the First World War that brought commercial vehicles, you could say, uh, in mass numbers. And then we come to the First World War, where I think road transport really came into its own. And the War Office had a subsidy scheme whereby it paid people a certain amount towards the cost of buying a new vehicle if, if it adhered to certain standard requirements. In return, they had the right to take over the vehicle if war broke out, there was a national emergency. Not only did they take over these vehicles, they commandeered a lot more from a lot more people as well. But it did put several manufacturers into sort of mass production with lorries through the war and afterwards. Several firms like AEC, Thornycroft, Albion made standardised vehicles. They were the backbone of the transport for the army and the services. And when the war was over, many, many of these vehicles were bought in government surplus sales and formed the backbone of the little haulage companies that sprang up all over the country. People would come out of the war with a small amount of money and you could go out and buy one of these things. And of course, it made times very, very hard for firms like Caledon to sell new vehicles because if you could buy something for two or three hundred pounds, you were hardly going to want to spend £1,500 on a new truck. And firms, even of the stature of Leyland, realised that they were up against an almost impossible obstacle here. Leyland got round it by saying that really no Leyland was worth having unless it had been overhauled by them, so they could charge, at least uh, earn a bit of money from, from checking them over. Steamers certainly were no use in the war because, first of all, they were too heavy and on, in muddy French fields or wherever, they were a bit of a dead loss. They also needed clean water and they needed coal or coke or anthracite, which is probably harder to carry than a, a tin of petrol. And also at night, of course, the glow from the fire might not be a, a terribly good idea if somebody was snarking at you. But yes, steamers carried on after a fashion into up to the Second World War almost with one or two manufacturers. Just looking at it in some slight detail, because you could say that all trucks were more or less the same of the period. There's no front wheel brakes, uh, solid tyres as you can see. Uh, the lights were acetylene, the headlights, and oil for the side lights. This great bolt here is to give the engine some flexibility because it was on a subframe so that if the wheels were at a funny angle it didn't break the crankshaft which it might have done if it hadn't been uh, cleverly suspended. All the sort of primitive things like clacks and horns. To look under the bonnet, very typical engine of that period. This is actually a 40 horsepower Dorman engine, roughly 7 litres. Um, as you can see, it, it's actually a four-cylinder engine, though it only looks like a two-cylinder, but it's two separate uh, blocks of two. It's magneto-ignition, so you don't have a battery, but equally you don't have a starter motor either. Uh, 
So old Mr. Armstrong comes into action down the front there and you crank him over. Now on a, a hot day, that's not a great problem because um, on tops of the cylinders there are little taps and you can let the compression off as many cylinders as you need to to be able to swing it over fast enough to get one of them to start and also you can prime them with petrol. But on a cold day it's a very different matter and we've actually had up to three people on a rope pulling on the handle to get it over fast enough to get the engine to fire up. And it's obviously a lot easier just to tow start and apparently in desperately cold mornings in transport yards for a start off the wagon they most wanted to get going they'd take the magneto to bed with them to make sure it was nice and warm and dry or leave it in the oven overnight and then the easiest starter once it was going it'd be used to tow start all the others ready for the day's work very very simple you are you are lucky to do more than, I think the legal speed was 12 miles an hour, but you were lucky to do more than about 15 miles an hour, and maybe 20 if you were very brave on a hill knocking it into neutral. Um, all very open the, the driving position. There was a storm sheet that you could pull up round you, so just your head stuck over the top and was clipped onto these press studs round the edge right hand controls here, the, the handbrake and the crash gearbox crash because there was no synchro mesh so you had to get the revs absolutely right before you could change gear and when you consider how poor the brakes were well obviously if you've only got uh, brakes on the back wheels um, particularly a vehicle like this working in Scotland on the hills there I mean it horrifies me to even think about it because we think we've got the brakes set up as well as they can be and yet even unladen, it's quite scary. Well, the transition from horse vehicles to motorised was actually very slow, in that even after the Second World War, you could still find the railways, among other people, with a lot of horse-drawn carts for very local delivery work. One of the snags in the very early days of motor vehicles was finding men who had any mechanical sympathy drivers tended to be selected from horse-drawn draymen because they knew their way around, they in theory knew where they were delivering to, but they didn't necessarily have any feeling for vehicles. This was probably an enormous problem in the early years. It led to the development of petrol electric buses where there is no gearbox, for example. Some large operators in towns and cities, particularly with buses, used to have to have roving mechanics to sort of deal with those that fell by the wayside quite frequently. Um, all that changed really after the First World War when the army had taught an awful lot of people how to drive and how to change gear, and how to be a little bit kinder to a vehicle. And it was never the same problem again, I think. So you could say that this was what early transport was all about up to late 20s. Pneumatic tyres were slowly coming in from the mid-twenties on these heavy vehicles and gradually refinements were coming in like windscreens, doors. So not a lot of change, probably over-engineered for the purpose, probably unnecessarily heavy, but there weren't the metallurgical skills then that were to develop. And in fact, probably things like the Model T Ford were the things that showed the way to the future in that they were cheap and cheerful, but so uh, low cost in the first place that you could afford to buy several and run them into the ground, whereas these things were virtually unburstable. Here we have a, a, a bean lorry, a bit smaller than the, the Caledon. This was actually a one and a half tonner, though in those days they were very nominal, the ratings they gave them. You, you could safely say that you could carry another 50% uh, and probably 100% fairly beefily built. Uh, Bean was an engineering firm in the black country who, who picked up on the idea of the Model T Ford, worked out that if you made vehicles in sufficiently big numbers you could bring the price down and poor old Bean didn't quite make the grade. It made good vehicles but they just couldn't compete with the Americans and in fact the government had brought in the McKenna duties 
to try and make it more and more difficult for Americans to uh, attack our home vehicle market. And the result of all this was that several of these American companies were tempted to set up factories here. Ford had already established one to make the Model T in Manchester, but General Motors followed suit and Chrysler Dodge came here in the 20s. And it was really that sort of American vehicle that spurred the death knell of, of firms like the poor old Bean, because they had the great benefit of being able to, to mass produce. Um, they had enormous factories, notably in Canada, making components. So they got the full benefit of scale, and they didn't have to pay any import duty on bits that came from Canada anyway. And they bolted them together here and actually revolutionized the lighter transport industry. I started off initially as a van boy on a single horse van, hanging on the back of the van with a chain. You don't see that now, but that was the recognised thing. The first thing I'd done when I got to work was to harness a horse. Harness him, make sure he had a bag of feed, fetch him out the stables, put him in the shafts, couple him up, and by that time, if the carman wasn't ready, I'd stand by, and then I'd wait. The cart would be backed onto the bank, the platform, that would be backed on, and the, car, the carman, that's called carman, to drive whatever, he would sort out the goods as he wanted them. And of course, the first delivery is right in the back. Uh, and while he's sorting the load out, I'd go to the stables, harness a horse, check it all around, give it a wash and brush, that sort of thing. And we had to put Stockholm tar, I remember this quite distinct, we had a can and a brush, Stockholm tar around the horse's hoof. Uh, that was most important this time of year because apparently maggots get in the horses, gets up in the hair and literally eats the horse away after a period of time. Well, the ostler, he would know that, but this was a precaution. Bedford's came on the scene in 1931, which, which was General Motors' answer, uh, and 31 marked the end of being. So it, it, was, it was that simple, it, the idea of having six sophisticated cylinders, fully enclosed cabs, car-type comforts at a low price was really too much for the haulage industry to ignore. There were, of course, the, still the heavier vehicles, the, the, the guys, the Thornycrofts, the Leylands, the Albions, but they were in much smaller niche markets, and also they could charge an awful lot more for their vehicles because they were literally the, the mainstay of haulage fleets ran all hours of day and night. When I first passed out as a driver, I was given a peak cap, which you had to wear. I worked the car to Patterson all the time. And the bus was there, and if he happened to see any of the drivers driving a lorry without his cap on, three days suspension, no argument. No matter about it, three days suspension. So we were all issued with a cap, the CP and company front, and a biscuit. And when I say biscuit, I mean a cushion. It was an old, um, smooth neck with horse hair and it was like a board and in those days we just had a wood three wooden slats on a metal frame and that was a seat and so you had to carry a cushion with you everywhere when you wasn't on duty paint the paint your name or your number on the side of the cushion that was your property and if you lost it by you had to sit on a bare board or make some sort of uh, temporary arrangements with regard to seating i can well remember Sitting in the lorry, driving a lorry, and there's a gap in the floorboard, and I can see the flywheel going round and round on the road. But now you can imagine what that's like in the winter. Never had start motors, never had heaters, and very seldom had windscreen wipers. Used to have a split windscreen, you know. No side covers, and the gear, gearbox and the handbrake was on the offside together. In those days, I, I think the average rate would be about two pounds. £2.50 a week for every goods driver you know, in those days because we're going back now to about 36, 37 before the war. The specialised firms were just beginning to realise that they'd finally defeated the, the steam vehicles and, and the final death knell for the steam vehicle was much greater taxation based on unladen weight. And so that more or less wiped them out in the 30s. Those Sentinel bravely kept trying to go with more and more and more clever steam vehicles that less and less and less people bought.
but the future in the heavy vehicle was the diesel engine, which had first been seen on the continent in the late 20s, and a few had been sold here like Mercedes and Sora. Uh, but Leyland, AEC and several others started developing their own diesels. And there was the Gardner Marine diesel, uh, which was spotted as being a potential engine to replace the, the proprietary engines that many of the other firms had used. And anyone really who picked a Gardner was onto a winner. Foden did. The new mark of ERF came on the scene and really took the industry by storm because they were so much more economical and the fuel was so much cheaper that, well, this, this became just a backwater. At the beginning of the 30s, Ford and uh, General Motors were importing American trucks which were using the same psychology as the Tin Lizzie. In other words, to produce cheap, reasonably reliable vehicles uh, at a price which everybody could afford. General Motors realized the inroads into the market that Fords were making with the, first of all, the T model and then the A model and the B model. They, at that time, they were importing the Chevrolet, which was the American cheap version, the equivalent of the A and B model Fords. It was decided that Vauxhall Motors, the General Motors subsidiary, should be the company in this country that would make the new Bedford. And first of all, the name was important. It had to be very English, and Bedford was taken, and production began. And right from the start, it was a winner. It was cheap, it was reliable, and it was far more attractive than the rather crude middleweight vehicles that were being produced by British manufacturers. And in a very short time, literally in two to three years, Bedford swept the market, not only in this country, but in export markets as well. The performance, reliability, and ease of repair was something that was attractive to not only the export market, but to the small operator in this country who drove the vehicle in the daytime and repaired it at night. This was a vehicle which he, with a little knowledge, he could keep on the road and he could keep it, the wheels turning effectively. It was introduced in two-ton and 30 underweight versions initially. It was offered for a small extra charge, a series of optional extras, one of them was a heavy-duty clutch, heavy-duty brakes, and heavy-duty battery, heavy-duty electrical system. This made the extra appeal. Subsequently, the demand was such that they introduced a, a three-ton model, and at the same time, the chassis was adapted for small 16-seat and 26-seat buses and coaches. Oh, an important thing to remember is that uh, not all trucks, despite uh, the ones we've been looking at, not all trucks were simply two-axle vehicles, which of course are called four-wheelers, uh, despite the fact that they have double tires at the rear. They're ignored for the purposes of calling them four-wheelers. Um, two axles were absolutely typical, um, but to get extra payload, uh, manufacturers began to realize that the, there must be ways of making bigger lorries. And Caledon had the, the distinction of making what was reckoned to be the first civilian market six-wheeler, in other words, a, a three-axle truck. And this was a, about a ten-tonner in 1923-ish. Um, the idea of six-wheelers had appealed to the army because they realized it gave you more tires in contact with the ground, but that was simply to give them cross-country abilities, whereas Caledon saw it as a way to carry more goods on the road. The other way you could do it was obviously to tow a trailer, and a compromise was an articulated vehicle. And Thornycroft, right back at the beginning of the century, had seen that Arctics were feasible, 
and, and had made the prototype, but unfortunately operators didn't uh, grab the idea. Uh, it took the First World War uh, and an American device called the Knox tractor to show that Arctics were viable, and it was the Knox that inspired Scammell to come up with their integrated Arctics straight after the First World War, which was a, a very clever, flexible way of carrying the absolute maximum quantity of goods on the road. So then you had rigid six-wheelers, articulated six-wheelers, or even eight-wheelers. And then, in the very early 30s, Sentinel came up with the idea of having another axle to make an eight-wheeler. And that's a rigid eight-wheeler. There were very few of the Sentinels built, but AEC took it one further with their Mammoth Major of 1934. And from then on, rigid eights were a very important part of the heavy haulage scene. It was a time of slump, and many men were desperate for a living. They were also obliging and prepared to drive all day or night, or most of both if necessary. Together with already established companies such as Pickford's, they helped develop a road transport industry that sold itself on service. Many of the newcomers didn't survive. They didn't, or couldn't, put money aside for repairs or depreciation. But in many cases, they ran rings around the service and the prices charged by the railways. The early 30s had already seen the introduction of restrictive legislation to curb the road transport industry, which had to prove need before gaining a license to move goods. The railways were usually able to prove they could do the job as well, at least in theory, and so prevent any license being granted. By the mid-1930s, in terms of durability and reliability, road transport made enormous strides, even though there was a 20 mile an hour speed limit for larger vehicles. The diesel engine had established its superiority, again for larger vehicles, and brakes, steering and suspensions had all improved. The most significant development of all was the pneumatic tyre which, by the late 1920s, had become sufficiently reliable to be a practical proposition on heavier vehicles. The military played their part too, taking a more active interest in vehicle design, and having an obsession over development of vehicles able to drive cross-country. They also continued the obsession with the petrol engine, considering fuel supplies of diesel unlikely to be sufficiently widely available and knowledge of their maintenance insufficiently widespread. The railways were large and bureaucratic, and collectively the country's largest employer, and they were used to doing things their way. Goods were picked up from a station siding once a day, taken somewhere else, remarshaled, and transported at slow speed to another marshalling yard, and then the process was repeated until the truck eventually reached another siding or goods depot. The railways were also saddled with a very complicated system of rates and charges imposed on them by Parliament when they were a monopoly. By the late 1930s, this difficult position had brought forth a combined appeal by the four main railway companies to the government and public for a square deal, which, rightly or wrongly, would have meant yet more restrictions on road haulage. But in the event, road haulage proved unstoppable. Now this might seem like a rather extraordinary example of what happened next in the 30s, uh, and in a way it is, because it's an Opal Blitz, which was a make actually that was available in Britain, and quite a few were sold because they were very cheap, and they competed head-on with, with the famous Bedford, uh, in that both Opal and Vauxhall, who made the Bedford, both belonged to General Motors. And in a way, this this sums up a great many things that, that went on. Um, for a start off, uh, it has a very refined six-cylinder engine. Many people who've looked at it have said, um, it is it virtually impossible to tell from a Bedford, and it's fairly plain that the same drawings were used. It has a five-speed gearbox. Uh, in this case, it's got four-wheel drive, so it's actually got a dual range five speed, um, so you've got a lower set of gears for cross-country use. 
it did have some wartime experience, as one can see from the, the bullet holes. Very little is actually known about how this vehicle came to be here. But certainly with its proper wind-up windows, its one-piece screen, it's still a crash box, but a much easier one to change. It's still petrol, and of course, um, that was to remain the case with, with vehicles up to about four or five tons. Comma had shown that the new Perkins diesel was feasible in things as light as 30 hundredweight, but in fact the fuel costs and the smaller vehicles were not so marked as they were in the high mileage, big heavier vehicles. So petrol carried on, and it particularly carried on through the war years because armies wanted to standardize fuel supply. And what had happened in the British market as the 30s wore on was that diesels spread down the weight range and in the later 30s a new law allowed trucks to do 30 miles an hour if they weighed under two and a half tons unladen and that led to a whole new breed of lightweight commercials that a very fine example is the new Seddon that came out then and obviously operators were beginning to see that uh, if they could do that extra speed, they could cover extra miles, and the whole thing became slightly more viable. I thoroughly enjoyed it, to be quite frank. There was no other traffic on the road, and it, I think it was everybody's desire in those days to be a driver. So as long as you was a, we were just coming out of the auto car era, you know, and everybody wanted to be, and I was one of the fortunate ones. Being a van boy, I automatically went up as a driver, you know, and I went in the army as a driver. Although I never had a license, when they knew that I could drive, I was instructor in the army in 1940, within two months of joining the army. I had a dual control with Morris Tumban, instructing other drivers, because we had armoured cars and vehicles in the early part of the world. It was all commandeered, and they wanted men to drive them, that they had no, no crews at all. So it was a crash job trying to teach some of these people to be drivers. That, that was the state we was in in 1940. You know, when the BEF come back from Dunkirk, left all the gear over there, was a shortage of gear and drivers, and you know, they, they realised it was a terrible state, state of affairs in 1940. But as I say, we did manage to get through, and there you are. If at times our lot at home seems hard to bear, and the sinews of war tighten round us, let us pause and take a look at this picture of the Western Desert and marvel how these troops bring up supplies through continuous shell fire from the enemy. the Second World War again led to greater reliability, more development and vehicles able to do cross-country operation which the military were always keen on. They were always having cross-country trials in the 1920s and 30s. They've always had this idea that you, you need lorries that don't run along roads but they're over fields and everywhere else. Reliability and durability and that has continued to the present day. Harder battles have been fought along this lifeline road through Burma than many with guns and rifles. It is the Mandalay Road joining the Burma Road, the great link between China and the outside world supplies. Tens of thousands of tons of war equipment have rumbled along its great length day and night to keep the armies of Chiang Kai-shek in the field against Japan. There have been Japanese bombings and all the misfortunes that nature could devise. It was a hard road, the road to Mandalay. The construction and use regulations of the early 30s uh, had just been evolved and it's significant that when the war came that all of these commercial vehicle manufacturers were able to adapt their production methods to churning out thousands of, of commercial vehicles which for military purposes were relatively unchanged. 
and then they were painted in a different manner and had the bus country tyres and all the rest of it. But basically they were the same vehicles that had been evolved in the late 30s. Most of the skilled personnel had been called up and it's another great significant point in my opinion that these same vehicles with the same design were built with at best semi-skilled labour and in many instances uh, people who had never been in a factory before. Up to the expectations of all well-informed people goes the Battle of Normandy. When these pictures were taken, the Allies were still without the port of Cherbourg. The feat of putting ashore a large army, tanks, guns and transport of all kinds, is stupendous beyond anything in warfare hitherto. Huge pontoons enabled lorries to be brought over in ships too heavy to beach in shallow water. The sands were converted to good roads by steel runways. Perhaps all this was not so good as a large port, but it was an excellent substitute. Self-propelled peace guns brought artillery within range of the retreating foe. It must be noted that all invasion vehicles prominently display a white star. Formerly an American marking exclusively, the star is now in general invasion use, no matter by what army the vehicles are employed or in what country manufactured. When the war finished, factories were readily adapted back to peacetime production. And again, I think it is a great tribute to British design that these vehicles didn't alter for at least 10 years. We came to the 50s before there was any real progress or any real development. The significant point about the 50s is that the new ideas that, which had been in the minds of engineers during the war couldn't be developed then and then there was a whole succession of new developments. There were still the same number of vehicle manufacturers and new ideas and new vehicles, new models started to come about using the materials which had been developed and one of the most significant of these developments was the use of aluminium alloy materials in body construction. But the big drawback, it was expensive but the relative advantage of weight saving made that extra expenditure justifiable. And then I carried on as a trunk driver. Oh, I think I stayed on there for about another 12 years on trunk, all night work. In those days we had seven different shifts, seven days uh, work and seven weeks of night work and that used to start at seven different times from six at night till midnight. So the first shift you would do a week, a week at night start at six, then then another one at uh, half past eight, then the one and there was an interim, and the last one was midnight, and you'd book on at midnight, book up at nine o'clock in the morning. And that was the worst shift by virtue of the fact in those days dark money was paid, what they call dark money, night money. For being out to bed all night long you would be paid four pence an hour from nine at night till six in the morning. Now, if you start at nine and work around six, you would have nine hours or four an hour, and that would make you money up. But, uh, but if you, for example, you had the midnight shift, you start at 12 o'clock on dark time, that's four per hour, round at six, and then your night money stopped at six. But you had still had to work around from six to nine at normal rate. That's all, you know, but I mean, you go back to days, but four per I was out in my bed all night for two shillings. And for six nights, because we used to book on Sunday night in those days, Sunday night to Saturday morning, 12 shillings for being out of bed all night. And that is a fact. And I had that for years and years. You know. And then, out of the blue, in 1957 came the Suez Crisis with the introduction of immediate fuel rationing. And the fuel ration was so incredibly small that vehicles fleets of vehicles came to a standstill. We were fortunate in as much that we had a subsidiary company with, with some 
depots and we were able to get BRS to do the trunking and although the fuel rationing only lasted for six weeks that was sufficient for us to realize that trunking to local depots had great advantages to us. From the trunking arrangement the next step was demountable bodies. The next step was to be able to carry those demountable bodies on articulated vehicles or even drawbar trailer vehicles to get completed loads on the demountable body to a local distribution point. The post-war years saw nationalisation on a grand scale, including that of the road haulage industry, which became part of the British Transport Commission in 1948. Well, the Labour government nationalised road transport just as it nationalised the railways. It formed mainly British road services, it is the one that immediately comes to mind. There was soon a change of political control in the government and the Conservatives came in and they thereupon decided they would denationalise road transport, which they did to an extent. Then we come to the 60s and the most significant aspect of the 60s was the introduction of what I still call the new legislation. The Prime Minister announced a cabinet reshuffle tonight. Here's our political correspondent, Hardiman Scott. The Prime Minister's cabinet reshuffle has produced one big surprise. The Minister of Transport, Tom Fraser, has resigned. He will go on to the back benches. And Britain gets its first woman Minister of Transport, Barbara Castle. Mrs. Castle, why do you think the Prime Minister has given you this job? Well, perhaps I have one qualification, and that is that I, I'm a great user of transport. My uh, job takes me uh, thousands of miles uh, in both public and private transport. And then perhaps you uh, do need someone in this job, which is bound to be an unpopular one, who's not afraid of being unpopular. Three important acts. First of all, the 1966 Construction and Use Regulation rewrote the old one which had stood us in good stead but was in view of the sophistication of, of uh, new commercial vehicles it was obviously outdated. It was also significant that for the first time ever before the legislation was introduced the department consulted with operators and trade associations to make sure that the legislation first of all was what the enforcement people needed and at the same time was workable from the operator's point of view. The following year saw the introduction of the Road Safety Act, which dealt with far more than just road safety. It saw the reintroduction, for instance, of the heavy goods vehicle license. The next piece of legislation, a terrific piece of legislation, was the 67 Transport Act. The current freedom for anybody to carry anything anywhere, in fact, belongs to the Labour Party under Barbara Castle when she was Minister of Transport. And she saw that really what was needed was some sort of legal system whereby, as long as the vehicle was fit and the operator was reputable, the government or the establishment shouldn't get involved in assessing whether there was demand for somebody to carry from A to B or whether the railways could do it better and all that kind of licensing nonsense there had been. This lorry is paying for its keep and so is its driver, but every time lorries stop to load and unload, they're not. Thousands of pounds are wasted every day on stationary transport. The transport bill will limit time spent at the wheel from 11 to 9 hours a day and the working day from 14 to 11 hours. Here, by putting the body of a lorry on legs, the cab and driver are freed in a few minutes to continue work with other bodies while this one is being loaded. However, the turnover to containers may mean less lorries like this so a special frame has been designed to support the standard rail and road container. This motor exhibition of commercial vehicles represents 50 years of progress in the British motor industry and I think illustrates Great Britain's 
preeminent position as a manufacturer and supplier of trucks and buses throughout the world. The 70s were a period of consolidation. Because of the new legislation, the membership of the trade associations, the Freight Transport Association and the Road Haulage Association had rocketed because the ordinary operator needed education in what, not only in the nuts and bolts of the legislation, but needed advice on what the effect it would have on its particular operation. If the 70s represented the zenith of the road transport industry, I think it would be true to say that the 80s saw the beginning of the rundown of truck manufacture, bus manufacture in this country. It saw the unwinding of a lot of the legislation which had benefited the industry in the sacred name of privatisation. All sorts of things were undone. But we hope that eventually that there will be a time when we shall come back as a British industry. The average demand for trucks in the UK is around about 45,000 a year. So it means that the British economy spends about one and a half billion pounds a year on trucks. Now if we don't make them ourselves, that will be one hell of a hole in our balance of payments. If you go further, if you don't have the assembly of vehicles based uh, in Britain, you take for example ourselves, we, our turnovers are around about 150 million pounds a year. Of that, we buy in approximately 100, 110 million pounds. 87% of that is actually bought from British manufacturers. If those vehicles are built abroad and imported in the UK, then the component base loses that. So the whole infrastructure of the British economy will suffer. And I do think it's very important for the British economy, if it is going to be successful, it is going to be vibrant in the future, that it has a number of core industries. And I think the most important of that is the automotive sector, because those core industries beget other work. So if, if we've got a strong car manufacturing base, if we've got a strong truck manufacturing base, if we've got a strong bus manufacturing base, then that is bound to be beneficial for the economy as a whole. So we've seen really that, that commercials uh, slowly evolved up, up until the, the last war, and really the changes afterwards weren't all that dramatic. I think anyone who'd known transport in the 30s would have recognized what went on afterwards. You, in general, the mass producers started moving up the weight range a bit. Diesels carried on moving down the weight range, so that by about 1960, just about everything was, was diesel-powered. Trucks got bigger and bigger, and they got faster and faster. Driver environment improved greatly. Uh, they always talked about bosses' motors, which was a rotten way of saying, you know, the boss would be able to extract the, the maximum amount of money out of you poor chap driving it. But then they started saying, well, it wouldn't be bad if the driver actually enjoyed his, his day at the wheel. So controls came lighter easy change gearboxes started to come in and it was extraordinary when synchromesh spread. They, they were on the lighter vehicles after the war, but the real heavies, particularly the imported vehicles that started to make a showing here in the 60s and 70s, brought things like proper heaters, properly suspended seats, a place that you could treat as your office. This particular vehicle now, it's uh it's air suspension outside. The cab is mounted on four points of air suspension. The seats are air suspended, electrically heated as well. I mean, it's much better appointed than your, than your average car. But they've come in leaps and bounds in the last ten years. It really is a pleasure to drive these things now. It's power clutch, air brakes, power steering. This particular one is what we call electronic diesel control. There's no linkages from the throttle to the pump. It's all done by wire to a computer. So it's, it's more or less foolproof starting away. You can't really stall it. Once the pump realises it's been starved of fuel, it releases more without you pressing the throttle. Of course, it's got the speed limiter built into the computer. 
to the new load of 56 miles an hour. And of course we've got this cruise control now, and we can set it to any speed. We can accelerate up to 56 or go you know, down to 40 or so as, you know, as the traffic allows. Road transport is more important to the welfare of the country than ever before. I suppose it can be argued that with the build-up of the motorway network, this has been almost inevitable. There is a big future in road transport, but the rail can't really compete. This road is so efficient. I mean, even the length and breadth of the country, you, you, you can put a 25-ton load on a vehicle in Cornwall one afternoon, and you can have it up in Scotland the next morning. Well, the, the rail couldn't cope with that, they need extra two days. So for the efficiency, it's, it's got to be road transport. Trucks or lorries or whatever one decides to call them have played a very important role this century. From a haulage point of view, they have more or less, well, wiped out the canals as a means of transport more or less made it impossible for railways to be particularly successful. In theory, railways are ideal for long-distance bulk haulage, but of course the goods still have to go onto a, a truck when they arrive at their destination. The reliability of trucks is all important nowadays. If you think the entire society that we live in is dependent on highly sophisticated logistical chains. So, for example, if you take industry, Industry nowadays is interested in very minimal stocks, so therefore it wants its parts delivered daily, and you need a reliable truck base to do that. If you take, take the retail industry, for example, people now want immediate availability. 10, 15 years ago, they were quite content with the corner shops. Now they want to access these vast hypermarkets where they can pick up everything they require at once. Now, to be able to support that, you need a very reliable infrastructure. People have asked us why a commercial vehicle museum of this quality in a little town called Leyland, based in Lancashire, way up in the northwest of England. It's quite simple, really. This really is the birthplace of the, the lorry in, in this country. A guy called James Sumner, in 1884, built the, a very crude steam wagon not 150 yards from where we're standing here today. So it was appropriate that the museum was housed um, in, in this little town called Leyland. Without question, uh, this is the finest collection of commercial vehicles housed under one roof anywhere in the world. We've got vehicles like this lovely Ford and steam wagon here, which was built in 1922. In the museum also, we have the oldest commercial vehicle in the world, which is a Thornycroft steam wagon built in 1896. So we are very proud of the collection we have here. It's important to have a museum to preserve the heritage of vehicle building in this country. I mean, after all, there are not very many truly British vehicle manufacturers left in the United Kingdom. And here in this museum, you can see an example of the highest of quality vehicles which were built through the decades going back as far as 1896. The commercial vehicle is responsible for supply and communication for the whole of the country. Without it, we would all be isolated communities. Here at Beaulieu, of course, we are trying to tell the history of motor road transport from 1896 onwards. It is in different sections, of course. We have the ordinary family car, we have racing cars, land speed vehicle cars, motorcycles. But one of the most important sections, of course, is our commercial vehicle section because they did play such an enormous contribution in the creation of modern Britain. I was very delighted way back in 1957 to have the very first ever rally for old commercial vehicles here at Beaulieu, and out of that grew the Historic Commercial Vehicle Society, of which I am president. The idea of the club is to really perpetuate and preserve these historic commercial vehicles,
which have made such enormous contribution to the uh, development of this country.